Mm. Uh, my name's Aaron. Uh, I'm a technical marketing engineer on Cisco's SD-WAN product team. Uh, I appreciate you guys letting me talk to you guys for, for a little bit, uh, and ladies. <laughs> so um, this presentation, we're going to focus a little bit on some of the new SD-WAN innovations that we have with regards to application quality of experience. Uh, and then I've got a little bit of a treat. Uh, one thing that was uh, kind of snuck into the description, but not so much into the title, which is some of the new innovations we have in security, particularly in umbrella security. So talk a little bit about that. First off, who am I? Um, so again, my name's Aaron. Uh, I'm a CCIE in security. I got it back in 2008, been doing uh, deployment work uh, for VPNs and remote access and unified communications. I've, I've done it all for a long time, been, been in the business for about 15 years or so. Uh, I'm a Midwest boy. Uh, I, I hail from Indianapolis, Indiana. It's where I still currently live. Uh, so I'm one of the lucky ones that Cisco lets work uh, remotely uh, as part of the product team. So again, what are we going to talk about here today? Um, so application quality of experience, or app QOE. I kind of like to just flash this slide up here for a moment um, just to kind of lay the groundwork, so to speak, for app QOE and what app QOE is and how we define app QOE or application quality of experience. Uh, so what is it? It's, it's basically a collection of tools or a collection of features that you guys can use within an SD-WAN environment to improve overall application experience or improve overall application performance, right? So some of these uh, little check marks, whatever, up on the screen will probably resonate with you. You might know what some of them are. Some of them you may never heard of before. And then a few of them we're going to double click on here today. The first of which we'll start off here with forward error correction. So this is a bit of a deep dive technical presentation. So hopefully a few, few of you guys will get some, get some good nuggets out of this. But how many people here are familiar with Redundant array of inexpensive disks. RAID. I know there's a few storage guys in here. Well, I'm not, a, I'm not a storage guy, but I know. All right. All right. That's what I thought. That's what I thought. That was the I know you guys setup. have had, had a lot of uh, 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 storage stuff in the previous days and whatnot. But RAID, right? So the idea behind RAID is, and, and I'll bring this into a, you know, connect these here in just a moment. But the idea behind RAID or redundant array of inex inexpensive disks is, uh, let's take RAID 5, for example, even though it's old. Uh, we have three disks, right? Two of those disks we're going to put data on. User data is going to be stored on those disks. The third disk is actually going to store information about the other two disks. And the idea behind RAID is that if one of those two disks, one of the two user disks, were to fail for some reason, we can replace it with a blank hard drive or a blank disk and repair all of the lost data using that third disk. So that third disk actually just stores a bunch of what you might call metadata about the other two uh, disks that store information, right? So the idea behind RAID is that we can recover from loss. FEC, or forward error correction as we call it, is essentially stealing a page from the storage guy's playbook. Okay, so what do we do here? Well, with FEC, basically what we're doing is we're, just like we would uh, have a RAID 5 with three hard drives, we're grouping packets up into blocks of four packets. Okay, so you can see here on the screen, we've got two different blocks here, right? Block one here has four different packets inside it. Now we also have a fifth packet, right? So it's five packets in total, but that fifth packet is what we call a parity packet. And the idea behind it here is if for whatever reason, I'm sending data across the WAN network, right? And one of my packets gets lost for some reason, I can use that parity packet to recover that lost data. All right, so it's a lot like RAID would do in a hard drive sense, right? We can recover a, a lost hard drive. In this case, we can recover a lost packet, okay? So it's a pretty cool feature, right? Um, now, a couple things to keep in mind here. Number one, when would I actually use this? I mean, obviously, yes, I'm going to use it when there's some loss on the link and I want to recover some of that loss. That, that totally makes sense. But what's the actual use case for this? Well, um, so number one, what we're finding is there's a lot of customers out there that are deploying SD-WAN, um, and they might find themselves with some, a couple remote branches out there in the middle of nowhere where there's really only one carrier that we can get out there. And we can only bring in one commodity internet circuit or one MPLS circuit. Okay, so one of the premises behind SD-WAN is that if you have multiple circuits, we can load balance across those circuits, or we can, uh, you know, um, 
correct for loss. If one circuit's lossy, we can move traffic over to another circuit. But what happens if there's only one circuit? <coughs> this is where FET can step in, right, and help you overcome that loss on that single circuit, right? So you might find this out in the wild at those locations, perhaps like uh, at a bank, for instance, right? You have a bank that has several thousand ATMs around the country. You might only have one circuit to each one of those ATMs, or perhaps even a, you know, an LTE connection or something to each one of those ATMs, right? I'm not gonna have dual circuits <coughs> to all my ATMs out there in the field. This is something, this is a feature, this is a technology that you can couple with that single circuit to make sure that those critical applications that are running on the ATM don't incur any loss in the transit path. Make sense? All right. <laughs> um, so a couple things about a couple additional things about FEC. Number one, it is dynamically invoked. So there's actually two methods, two ways that you can you can turn it on. One, you can turn it on all the time. The other method you could do, use is dynamically. So whenever the network or whenever the SD-WAN environment uh, realizes that there's at least two percent loss, we can turn it on. Right? Now you don't want to go enabling this feature for every single application under the sun because it, it is somewhat a, of a computational tax on the receiving router that has to reassemble some of, the, uh, some of the packets that have been lost. It's not a huge tax. I mean, we're talking maybe 10% on the CPU, 10-ish percent, something like that. But it is a tax, right? And depending on how many applications you're looking to rebuild, it could be more and more and more, uh, you know, depending on how much data that router is processing. Right? Now, if you're a somewhat competent engineer, one of the things that might be going through your mind right now is, what happens about bursty flows? Okay, this is all well and good, you know, when I've got nice little four byte or four packet streams, you know, and, and the network's not all that busy, and FET can do its job, and you know, so on and so forth. But, you know, networks are typically bursty by nature, right? We, we got a, a big burst of, of traffic, and then it goes dormant for a little while. So, for bursty streams, there's a couple ways that we can solve that. The first way that we can solve that with FEC is to actually break those streams up a little bit, right? So if we've got 10 people that are transmitting data all at one time, so we've got this big burst influx of data all of a sudden, what we can do is for these four, these four packet blocks here, instead of just taking each packet sequentially for each flow, what we'll do is we'll take one packet from, let's say, each, each flow, right? So we'll take... Um, from flow number one, we'll take a packet. From flow number two, we'll take a packet. From flow, flow number three, we'll take a packet. So on and so forth. So the idea is each one of these four packet blocks is actually re representative of multiple flows. Okay, so if one packet is lost, we're only impacting one user's flow, and hopefully we're reassembling or reconstructing that packet on the other end. Okay, so that helps us kind of overcome some of the bursty natures of network, networking. The other piece to this is uh, if you have two circuits. So if you do have two circuits, right, and you want to turn FEC on, you can actually get some, you know, get some advantages with FEC in that we can actually spread some of these four, four, uh, four packet uh, blocks out across two different circuits, right, to further help, uh, further help overcome that, uh, 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 not only loss, but overcome that bursty nature of networks. All right, so pretty, pretty cool feature. Let me show you a demo really quick here. You can see what I'm talking about. So, first things first, it's a pretty simple demo. Um, I've got a Spirit traffic generator here. I know this is a somewhat, uh, maybe a little bit difficult for you guys to read, so I'll, I'll, I'll read off what some of the values are here so you can, you can see it for yourself or you know, listen to me, whatever you wanna do. Uh, but the idea here is, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna generate some traffic from a uh, Spirit traffic generator to a receiver. Uh, and this is going to go across two V-Edge routers that have FEC enabled, okay? So initially, I do not have FEC enabled, but I do have an impairment device sitting in the WAN that's interjecting 5% loss on the receive side and 5% loss on the transmit side. So let me go ahead and fire up this traffic, and I'll show you what I mean. So go ahead and hit start here. Now, as soon as I do that, you can immediately see we have some transmitted frames, we have some received frames, so on and so forth. But you can see we've got a lot of dropped frames right here, and you can see right about 4.994, 5.0% loss. Right? So we've got 5% loss on this link. Okay? FEC is not enabled at this point, but let's go ahead and enable FEC. So I'm going to hop over here to my vManage. 
I'm assuming you guys are, you know, some of you are at least somewhat familiar with vManage. vManage is our controller. vManage is our graphical user interface that we use to uh, administer anything SD-WAN related. So administration, monitoring, provisioning, conf uh, configuration, uh, everything rolls up through vManage here. So this is that dashboard. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to head under the configuration menu under policies. Now real quick, just to show you where you can activate this feature, if I click on add policy here, and I lost my window, let me make that a little bit smaller. I'm going to add a traffic data policy. Now again, this is just to show you uh, where you can add this, but under QoS or under a custom policy here, I can enable this feature. Now what's nice about this is I can select <coughs> IP address ranges, I can, accept, I, I can, I can select uh, user applications, I can select an individual users, so on and so forth. I've got all sorts of match criteria that I can identify. And then ultimately here, under the Actions tab, I can, can accept... Can you Command Plus it a bit? I'm sorry? Can you Command Plus it? Oh yeah, absolutely, I'm sorry. Does that help? I'm old, yeah. Yeah, all right, <laughs> no worries. So ultimately, once we've matched on whatever application, whatever traffic stream that we're looking for here, you can see under the match conditions, we have a loss correction tab. Okay, so if I click on that really quick here, you see we've got a couple options. We've got FEC adaptive, FEC always, and packet duplication. Now we're going to talk about packet duplication in just a moment here, but FEC adaptive and FEC always. Remember FEC always, like the name implies, it's always going to be on for this particular application. FEC adaptive, we're only going to kick it on when there's 2% loss in the network. Okay? So, I've already got a pre-made policy that I'm just going to activate here. So we'll just activate this guy down here. <coughs> now, as soon as I do this, if I head back over to my RDP screen, let me make this a little bit bigger so you guys can see. As big as I can here. Now, as soon as I do that, you can immediately start to see the dropped frame count is starting to tank a little bit, starting to go back down to zero. So right now it's at 4.2. I'm going to reset the counters just to make that go a little bit quicker. Now, as soon as I do that, what you can see is we are still sending quite a bit of traffic into the network. What you'll notice here is we no longer have dropped uh, frames, no longer have dropped traffic. So FEC is able to recover 5% of loss in both directions, All right? Pretty simple, pretty, you know, nothing, nothing special. We use XOR as the algorithm. Right? So whenever there's a lost packet or whenever there's a, a loss within the network, uh, it's, it's a pretty simple equation, right? It's kind of like uh, 1 plus 2 equals 3. If we lose 2 through deduction, we can figure out that uh, 1 plus x equals 3. We can figure out what we lost, right? That's all FEC's doing for us. So let's go ahead and stop this, and we'll continue on here. So the next feature that we have is pretty self-explanatory. Right? Uh, two is always better than one, right? So if you have those applications out there on the network that need uh, uh, the, the, the utmost amount of reliability, the utmost amount of, of no loss, right? We have a feature called packet duplication. And exactly as the name would imply, that's exactly what we're doing. If you have two circuits, you can identify the application, you can identify the, you know, the user, or the stream, the, the information that you want to duplicate, and we will duplicate it across two separate links for you, right? And the idea is, if we lose traffic off of one link, we can pick it up off of the other link. Pretty simple, right? So, interesting, couple interesting things to note about packet duplication. Number one, as with FEC as well, that I, I didn't mention this, but they are both pr protocol agnostic, right? So you can use it with TCP, you can use it with UDP, you can use it with ESP, I mean, in, you know, any kind of protocol that you want. Now, the interesting thing here is packet duplication really has a use case when it comes to voice, right? Now, FEC, you know, FEC, you can make an argument either way because FEC can also introduce a little bit of computational delay, right? And that may not be good for voice, but packet duplication is one of those things that's absolutely, you know, we can duplicate that voice stream. So if we have very high profile, very important calls that need to go through, we can duplicate that voice stream as long as we're using a, a reasonable codec that's not using up a whole bunch of bandwidth. This is not going to be a huge tax uh, on your network to duplicate that, that call. All right. Yes, sir. It's got a very quick question around FEC. Mm -hmm. You're producing an extra packet, so your bandwidth increases. That's correct. But it's only between the two V edges. That's correct. Right. So the yeah. on, there's no on, on post. Uh, computational overhead is s small. Yeah. So it, it, horrible. Yeah. So we're, we're talking, um, and, and I don't know if I need to repeat the question, but you know, the question is if if if, if the uh, yeah. All right. <laughs> then I won't repeat it. The um, so. 
the computational overhead of FEC is, is it grows linearly uh, based on the amount of, of uh, packets that the, that the router is processing, mm -hmm. right? So uh, in our testing, right, so we had a, like an ISR 4331 that we turned it on with. Um, we saw, generally speaking, with 1% loss, we saw about an 8 to 10% CPU hit. Okay. Okay. And that's when we were processing uh, close to 30,000 packets. Okay. So, I mean, we, we had quite a bit of traffic going through that, and it wasn't that big of a hit. Right. right? So from a branch perspective, 8 to 10%. But you're not going to turn FEC on for everything. That's it, exactly right. Exactly right. Yeah. Um, from, a, from a branch, I'm sorry, go ahead. So, yeah, you're only going to pick it for a subset of traffic. You wouldn't exactly. recommend turning FEC on for the entire link or the entire capacity because you are going to burn CPU. You're going to exactly. add some processing latency. So, yep. you need to be conservative. It's like quos. You are going to need to do it to exactly. the traffic. Right? Exactly. Yep. 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 So, uh, yeah, and just to, just to kind of continue on that, if you've got like a a branch router, eight to ten percent, something like that, but maybe somewhere at the head end, like an aggregation router or something like that. Uh, you definitely want to be careful about how to turn it on, uh, and probably make sure that you're not uh, already running hot on CPU anyway. Yeah. I would say somewhere, you know, if you're somewhere thirty to forty percent CPU and you turn it on, you can expect another, let's say, ten to fifteen percent, twenty percent added on there. You're still within that safe bounds of that router. Okay. No, no big deal. Uh, but again, so packet duplication. As the name would imply, pretty simple, pretty easy. You turn it on the same way in the same uh, 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 policy structure that I was just in. This has very good merit for voice, however. As, as I said, if you've got a high, high profile call, since FEC can introduce computational overhead, that means delay for a phone call. You know, kind of hit or miss there, right? But packet duplication, we're duplicating that, that, uh, that stream. Whichever stream makes it to the remote router first wins. The other stream's discarded. Okay. Also keep in mind, though, that because we are duplicating this, we're duplicating bandwidth as well. So you want to be careful here about turning it on for everything under the sun. <coughs> right? You said stream? Is it stream or packet? Uh, packet. I'm sorry. Right. Yeah. And so um, <coughs> in this particular system, we're dealing with, you know, links possibly to different latencies? Correct. How are you handling that on the... Um, so basically what we do is we will evaluate all of the different circuits that you have available. So first off, Let's say you have, you have an intelligent routing policy that says voice should always prefer MPLS. Okay, so we're, we're always going to send that voice stream or the, those voice packets down MPLS. <coughs> we're then going to evaluate the other circuits to find out which ones have the lowest loss latency and jitter, and we're going to choose the second best one, mm -hmm. and then send the stream, send the duplicate stream down that way. So if MPLS were to encounter, all of a sudden just encounter a bunch of loss, you've got it backed up, even though perhaps the internet circuit was you know, maybe had a little bit more latency and it's going to get there a little bit later, we at least have the packets and the call's still up. The call probably, you know, MOS score might, you know, <coughs> who knows, might drop a little bit, but... I'm talking more of concern about out-of-order packets. So let's say we have a link with 10 milliseconds as our latency. Yes. We have another link that's a lot slower, that's 50 milliseconds yes. latency. I drop one packet on the 10 millisecond link, but it comes off across the 50 millisecond link. It's going to show up after... Yes. A number of other packets have shown up on the 10 millisecond link. We've and so you have to add a buffer, right? Yes. And so what is that buffer? Is that configurable? Is that something that we can... The buffer is not configurable. Um, the, we will reorder the packets when they, when, when they come in. So if we are missing packet two, and, you know, in, in your example, uh, mm -hmm. we'll wait for packet two to come in on, on, the, on the secondary circuit, reassemble the stream, and send it on its way. So, but what is the maximum buffer? Like, um, so you figured that actually both sides lost it or something like that. Yeah, so the... <laughs> The, the actual buffer itself, I, like I said, I don't know that it's tunable from a user perspective. Um, and actually, you know what, the more, the more that I think about it, um, you're probably, um, w w we're actually not doing any buffering. I'm sorry, I, I, I stand corrected. So first packet comes in, we're going to send that first packet immediately. Uh, third, fourth, fifth packet comes in. If there is a high amount of latency on this circuit, we might have missed packet two for sure. If there's it's 150 milliseconds on this link and there's 20 milliseconds on this link, um, the idea behind this, though, is not to overcome latency. This, this well, particular, yeah, yeah, yeah. and, and I'm, I'm just for the benefit of the group. The, yeah. the idea behind this feature is not to overcome latency, but to overcome loss. Okay, so um, if you do have very high disparities between latencies on links, that's actually uh, a, a segue into the next feature, which is TCP optimization, where we can we can help optimize uh, some of those some of those flows that are going across. Um, uh, links that might have uh, high latency or high delay values. Okay, so the third, the, the third feature, kind of on that note, 
is uh, if you look at a TCP network, if you look at an overall network in general, uh, particularly TCP, TCP is a rather old protocol. It, it's not very well suited in today's networks. Uh, it's, it's somewhat, uh, it's a reliable protocol, but somewhat inefficient in how it uses bandwidth. If you look at a typical, uh, let's call it a line graph of, a, of a t how TCP uses bandwidth, it'll start sending traffic as, as fast as it possibly can, peak out the bandwidth, right? And then the line graph might look something like this, because once it encounters loss, it will drop off 50%, and then it will ramp back up, drop off 50%, so on and so forth. So this is what a host's stream might look like as it's sending traffic. We, you know, most of the good networking guys in here probably know this. That's not great. That's not a great use of bandwidth. That's actually a really aggressive way to overcome loss. So one of the features that we're implementing to help uh, or, I'm sorry, to, not to overcome loss, but to overcome delay sensitive or, or delayed networks or latency uh, uh, laden networks. Um, one of the features that we're bringing in to help correct for that is TCP optimization. Now, this has always been within the SD WAN framework, right? We've always had the cubic algorithm that you could turn on. The problem was, is cubic, it was okay, but uh, chances are, uh, your network, uh, your, your network drivers, your 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 uh, protocol stack within your laptops had better uh, optimization algorithms built into them, uh, and Cubic didn't really buy you a whole lot, right? So we've updated it essentially, right? So we're now moving towards, and we've just recently introduced the uh, BBR algorithm, which is Google's uh, Google's homegrown algorithm. If you browse the Google website or you've browsed to YouTube.com, you've been taking part in uh, a BBR exchange, and you probably didn't even know it. <coughs> Right, but the idea behind BBR is TCP in general had to wait on loss before it could correct for that congestion. In other words, TCP, when it saw loss, it assumed that there was congestion in the network. Right? What BBR does is instead is it kind of watches the network. Right? Uh, in other words, our routers will actually step in in proxy in place of the end hosts, and the, our routers will watch these TCP flows, watch these TCP sessions going on within the network, and our routers will actually control, kind of act like gatekeepers as to who's allowed to talk on the network uh, at the time. So the net effect of this is our routers uh, will essentially provide a more efficient use and a more fair use of bandwidth. Okay, so no, under normal circumstances, if you just leave people to their own demise, you know, leave networks to their own demise, uh, most computers will just start sending as fast as they can. They'll go into that back off algorithm and it'll start looking like this again, and networks just start acting, you know, you know, some users don't get much bandwidth, some users get a lot of bandwidth. It's just not great. The idea behind BBR is that these routers now step in in proxy to help make more efficient use of that bandwidth. Okay? Now, I got a bit of a demo to show you what I mean by this. So I'm gonna head back over to my RDP session here. And don't hate me, <laughs> but I have an RDP window within an RDP window here. I'm gonna make it as big as I possibly can though. So I'm gonna open this up here. Now, what I've got here is a tool called iPerf. I'm sure you guys have all probably heard of iPerf. You've maybe even used iPerf to, to take a look at what kind of bandwidth you have available and how your hosts are using that bandwidth. So what I want to do here is set up a transaction between a client and a server. Okay, so I've got a PC here. I've got a server sitting over in the data center. And what I'm going to do is establish an iPerf session to that server. And iPerf is going to download traffic or download stuff off of that remote server uh, in order to measure how much bandwidth that it's giving. Now, the important thing about this is I'm going to uh, actually set up 20 different simultaneous streams. Okay, so the idea here is I want to mimic what 20 different <coughs> users would look like if they're all of a sudden hitting that server at the same time. So to do that, let me go ahead and kick this off. So we'll run this just a few times. If you, I mean, you can kind of ignore what it's doing here, but you can see um, the important thing that I want to note here is if you look at some of the outputs here, what you can see here is the sender, the server in this case, was able to send 200 kilobits of data, 210, 210, 210, 210, 210, 524 for this guy. What I'm trying to get at here, and we'll run this just a couple times while I'm talking, what I'm trying to get at here is it's not entirely fair, right? Some clients got more, uh, more bandwidth than other clients did, right? Some, some of them were fair, some of them weren't, some clients got tons more, right? 
So the idea behind BBR here, <coughs> again, you can look at it here, 315, 315, 210, uh, 117, uh, you know, right? You can, you can kind of do the math. The idea here is it's not fair. So let's go ahead and turn on TCP optimization and watch, and watch what happens to some of these numbers. Again, the idea behind TCP optimization is that the routers will now become more of a gatekeeper into the network to prevent TCP from being so aggressive and allow a more fair and efficient use of that bandwidth. So I'll go ahead and enable the TCP optimization policy real quick here. And refresh a couple times, there we go. We'll hop back over to our screen here and let's rerun our test a couple times. Now again, TCP optimization may or may not net you more bandwidth. The idea though is that you have more efficient use of that bandwidth. So each user gets their fair share and we're gonna lower delay, right? We're gonna lower delay, we're gonna lower uh, latency here. So what you can see here, 314, 4, uh, 419, 314, 314, 314, 314, 419, my point is, is much more distributed, right? Not one client's getting 600K of bandwidth, the other ones are getting 200. Not one client's getting one mega bandwidth and the rest of them are getting 200. It's much more distributed. In fact, most of these guys have 314 with the exception of this guy right here, which has 419, okay? Which just could be more of a product of, you know, he was the last guy to send traffic and nobody else was sending. What happens when everybody's doing BBR? Like BBR overruns cubic. The yeah. majority of the internet today is running cubic. Yes. So the advantage of BBR is that you actually get to stomp on everybody else's traffic, which I like. Right? <laughs> right. Yeah. Which is great because everybody needs to upgrade their systems and too bad if you don't, sucks to be you. Yeah. Right? Yep. We need to promote upgrading and refreshing in it and that type of thing. <coughs> yep. Um, the challenge is going to be, um, I don't, at this point, because you're terminating the TCP session and then reinitiating so you can change the windowing. In it, Correct. I assume yeah. there's a bunch of other stuff going on yes. as well in addition to the, mm -hmm. to the BBR. Um, that's a middle box on the internet and that breaks a whole bunch of fundamental assumptions. Are you ready to cope with that adapt and keep adapting as time goes by? Um, I'm, I'm not sure what you mean by assumptions. So, you know, we're looking at quick. So now we're changing away from TCP. By and large, most of the traffic is already quick. Yes. And so this feature is kind of less relevant, sort of, because quick automatically implements, well, if you're using quick out of prime, then you're automatic using BBR. So. Right, right. You know, it's a very fluid environment. Are you going to be flexible enough to change and catch up? Um, I like to think so. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. So. Um, yeah. Yeah. So. So. Um, uh, when Viptela was first acquired, we we you know we we had the cubic algorithm. So BBR has been uh, something that's been on the roadmap now for about. Uh, I don't know about a year or so. So I guess it depends on your your. Um, Definition of what quick is, how quick we can how quick we can respond to the to the market when a new algorithm comes out. Yep. Um, now, as part of that acquisition, as part of you know the overall evolution of this particular solution, obviously now it's on ISRs. We have quite a bit more flexibility in what we can do with ISRs and, and horsepower and whatnot. Mm. Um, so. Yeah, I mean, I, 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 you know, I like to think that yes, we can be quick to the market in, in you know, if the market were to shift again, and if there's if there's some additional protocol, yeah. some additional uh, algorithm that we want to use, absolutely, it'll. Yeah, you know. look, I'm just, I guess, I'm flagging for the audience: be careful with this, because when you intercept the TCP session, uh, there are consequences, sometimes I, unexpected yeah. consequences. So don't Understood. just think that going and turning this on because you're actually putting a middle box <coughs> in the TCP flow. Yeah, and it might be. That's a very good point. Yeah, it's a good point. I mean, it's it, it, it's it's a it's a lot like in the old days. Uh, we used to do uh, uh, a TCP proxy uh, and, and firewalls, right? So we can inspect that. Yeah, and, and that's a not only a big overhead that you're putting on the on the on the router on the firewall, whatever that's doing it, uh, but. Yeah, in the case that uh, the, those end-to-end -end hosts perhaps were maybe using a different protocol or perhaps yes. were using a different algorithm, now we're interjecting ourselves in the middle of that. Mm. I totally get your point. Uh, and it's, yeah, it's, it's definitely it's something that... You go like, oh, this video, click at it, and then something goes, you yeah. know, just a little caution, yeah. a little practical assumption, yeah. Understood. Mm. All right, so let me wrap this up real quick. Um, final thing I want to show you is, is, is I want to shift gears here for a moment in the last couple minutes and talk a little bit about security. Okay, so with most SD-WAN conversations, you're talking about commodity internet, you're talking about getting rid of MPLS, potentially some, some guys are keeping it, some guys are getting rid of it. 
In so doing, you can't have any SD-WAN conversation nowadays without talking about security, right? I mean, it's on top of mind for everybody. Now, I flashed this slide. This slide may be familiar. Some of you might have even seen this slide in, in other presentations and whatnot. But I show this for those of you that, that you know, are interested. We do have a full suite of security capabilities built into the router itself. So fire, you know, an advanced firewall, intrusion detection prevention, URL filtering, AMP threat grid, all of that fun stuff. However, we run into a situation where a customer uh, may not necessarily have equipment sitting out at the remote branch that's capable of running all of this. What happens to them? Right? What happens to these guys that need, uh, need URL filtering out at the branch? And for that, what we're introducing is a new product called Umbrella Secure Internet Gateway, or Umbrella SIG. You guys are probably somewhat familiar with Umbrella, right? With DNS redirection and command and control, you know, monitoring and that sort of thing. Same concept here. We're still doing the whole DNS redirection, but we're at, now we're actually adding in cloud-hosted firewall and cloud-hosted web content filtering as well. So the idea here is, is that your branch routers, instead of having to host all that security stuff on themselves, they can offload it up into the cloud and let Cisco take care of it. So your branch routers are just going to build a VPN tunnel to the nearest cloud security gateway. Right? And any direct internet access or any, any internet bound traffic is actually going to flow to the umbrella solution where it can be processed by a next generation firewall. It can be processed through a secure web gateway functionality, right? So we can check all the content that's coming through, AMP, threat grid, URL filtering, you name it, we can do it. Now this solution has three different components to it to be aware of. First one is DNS layer security. We already know about that one. That, that's inherent to Umbrella, right? So we do DNS redirection. We scrub those DNS requests, make sure they're not going to anywhere malicious, and then we can kill it right there. If we pass this first check, then we move on to a cloud-delivered firewall, right? There's all sorts of stuff that you can configure uh, within Umbrella. And I don't know, I'm running out of time here, but I could show you that. Uh, on, within, the, uh, within the firewall, we can do uh, port, we can do protocol, we can do IP address, we can even do user, right? Active Directory user, uh, if you want to permit or deny them internet access. Once we pass the firewall check, then we move into the secure web gateway where we can inspect HTTP traffic, HTTPS traffic, we can unencrypt it, pardon me, uh, we can unencrypt that, uh, excuse me, unencrypt that traffic uh, and process it. We can process any content or any, uh, 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 I, I should say, web content within that traffic. So if you have a uh, business policy that says you're not allowed to use Facebook gaming, you can get to Facebook, but I'm not, not going to let you use Facebook gaming. You can actually control that here from within Umbrella, right? And like I said, your routers for any internet bound traffic, they're just going to forward that traffic through an encrypted tunnel up to Umbrella, process it through this stack here. And as long as it passes that check, it's good to go. It'll be sent out to the internet. The return traffic will then come back through Umbrella. And we'll make sure none of the return traffic has anything malicious in it. Forward it right back down to the tunnel, right back to the originating host. The nice thing is, again, there's no additional burden that you're adding to the end, uh, to the, to the uh, Very route. Very good question. Yes, sir. Are they delivered as a single product or are they delivered as each separate licenses? These are all delivered as, as a single product. Okay, great. Yeah, yeah so this is going to come... Um, uh, so basically your SD-WAN subscription, right? Yeah. So you'll, you'll have like a 250 megabit subscription license or whatever. Um, anything up to 500 megabit, it's one megabit per user. So if you have a 500 meg license, you've got 500 user licenses for this kind of stuff. Wow, that's complicated. Cool. Gee whiz. <laughs> okay. Right? So that being said, I think I'm a bit out of time here. Um, I've got a demo that I can show you here, uh, but I think uh, you know a lot of you guys have probably already seen the Umbrella dashboard. You, you might already be familiar with it. Um, but yeah, it's much like a firewall. I think we've all seen firewalls in here. We know, <laughs> we, we know what rule processing looks like, right? Yep. Just know that, uh, like I said, you can, you can inspect web content. You can inspect all that web traffic, including secure traffic, uh, through the Umbrella service with no additional impact on the end router.